Good evening. We have an environmental lawmaking crisis in the United States right now. As Dr. McCarthy explained, we have good reason to believe that global climate change is the most pressing environmental problem of our time, with potentially catastrophic consequences worldwide. We also have reason to believe that our nation is disproportionately responsible for creating this very real threat. Yet this country has still not enacted any comprehensive national legislation to address the problem. None. That's a crisis. And the challenge we face as a nation is to prevent that crisis from becoming a full-fledged tragedy. So how do we do that? That's what I am here to tell you, and I have approximately nine minutes and 20 seconds left to do so. <laughs> Three steps. First, identify the cause of the crisis. Second, to target that cause for reform. And third, to tell you what you can do. First, the source of the crisis. Don't get fooled by the blame game. There's no single climate bad guy out there. It's not the fault of the banks, a big business, or one political party, or some truly misguided emails sent by some otherwise very well-meaning scientists. The root cause of our lawmaking crisis is far more embedded. It is no less than a fundamental incompatibility between our nation's framework for making law and the features of the global climate change problem. Our lawmaking system responds best to problems with relatively small time and space horizons. That is because of how and how often we elect members of Congress. It is because of how we fragment authority between branches of government, and because of how we fragment authority within branches of government. We can easily pass laws that address problems where cause and effect are readily perceived, because then we can be confident that a law that targets the cause will in fact achieve a benefit. We can likewise easily pass laws where the benefits of the laws are enjoyed closer to home, because then those subject to the law are also the ones who enjoy the benefits. And we can pass laws where the benefit of the law is enjoyed sooner rather than later, because the costs imposed by the law are quickly offset by benefits, and the elected officials can therefore be awarded rather than penalized at the ballot box. But climate change is, for all these reasons, a lawmaking disaster. All the incentives are wrong. The cause and effect occurs over decades, 50, 60 years, and more, and takes decades to undo. The cause and effect occurs over thousands of miles, literally circling the globe. And those parts of the globe who now seem destined to suffer the most in the near term are not those who caused the problem in the first instance, or those with the resources to address it. Global climate change presents political responsibilities without political accountability. That is why Global climate change legislation is going nowhere right now in Washington, D.C. Three years ago, when today's seniors were mere freshmen, legislation seemed like a virtual certainty. The nation had a truly historic moment. All the lawmaking pieces were in place. We had a president of the United States who believed in it, climate change. And he appointed to the executive branch Lisa Jackson at EPA, Stephen Chu at Energy, Carol Browner in the White House, the Senate leadership, the House leadership, the chairs of all the significant committees, everyone in every place was a believer in the need for sweeping global climate change legislation. But what do we have to show for it three years later? Nothing. In fact, worse than nothing. No one will touch global climate change not even a president who campaigned on it and believes in it. Here's what Barack Obama said during his first week in office. He recognized the urgent dangers, the long-term threat of climate change. He talked about the irreversible catastrophe, the violent conflict, the terrible storms, and he described how these are the facts, and the American people know it. Now, even the President of the United States won't say the word. In 2009, 
in 69 speeches and remarks, President Obama used the word global warming or global climate change or climate change. In 2010, President Obama said it in 73 speeches and remarks. How many times do you think the President of the United States said it in 2011? 50? 40? 25? 10? 9? 8? 7? 5? Try one. One time. January 19th, 2011. In a meeting, a press conference with the President of China, who raised the issue first, and the President said it in response. President China raised it as an area of partnership between the United States and China. Not once since January 19th. That's global climate change as Voldemort. <laughs> the problem that even the President of the United States dare not name. Okay, on to the second point. How do we break through the crisis? How do we address the root cause? We can change the lawmaking process so we can finally address climate change. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we can't change the Constitution, and that's actually part of the problem. We can't change it, in many ways we shouldn't. But there's stuff we can do in between. Three things. One, reduce the leverage of narrow short-term interest in the political process. Two, provide greater political voice for longer, broader-term interests in government. And three, promote and protect the states that are assuming leadership roles in climate change. First, to reduce the leverage of short-term interests, we should start by eliminating the current filibuster rule in the Senate. Under current Senate practices, the U.S. Senate has effectively converted a majority rule into a supermajority rule. Under Article I, Section 5 of the Constitution, each House or each chamber may determine the rules of its proceedings. The Senate has misused the provision by making it far too easy to filibuster. No one has to stand there now for days and days like Jimmy Stewart did and Mr. Smith goes to Washington to do a filibuster. Today, all one senator needs to do is threaten to filibuster. And then the other side needs the supermajority to get the legislation back on track. This is the procedure which killed global climate change legislation in 2009 after it passed the House. That was an historic mistake. And the filibuster rule needs to be reformed and be made sensible. Second. We need to empower longer-term interests in the political process. Politicians seeking elected office are obsessed with short-term economic indicators at the expense of environmental sustainability. We need to change those indicators to reflect long-term concerns. Concerns with resource degradation, concerns with resource depletion, concerns with environmental contamination. Reflect them in what is the economic health of the nation. Economists know how to do this. They know how to accomplish it and the reform is long overdue. We also need proactively to create an authoritative voice for the future generations within government, to recognize an important voice which is otherwise missing. Other countries have done this. We can too. Finally, we need to protect and promote those states who are unilaterally adopting ambitious efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. A few courageous states are doing that, and they're trying to lead the nation now by example. California is doing so. And here in the Northeast, 10 states in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative are doing so, as are other states in the country. We need to promote those efforts. We need to defend the legality. We need to defeat efforts by some in Congress to deprive states of their authority. If these states are permitted to act, they can, they can establish precedent that the nation can follow. Third point, what can you do? First. Do not just think green, be green. How you live your life. Reduce your own carbon footprint. It can be done. Otherwise, you lack the moral authority to suggest that others do the same. Second, don't just occupy Wall Street from the outside in tents. Occupy Wall Street from the inside. Be Wall Street. We need business leaders who believe in global climate change, who recognize that it's real, who understand what it means for business, or realize it's not in the interest of business to fictionalize science, that it's going to have real effects on business, on investments, on insurance, who realize that the new profits be made by being green. We are on the cusp of extraordinary technological innovation. Many of you may create them. New sources of energy, 
new efficiencies. We need business leaders to convert these great products into great, these great inventions into great products. Much of this nation's great greatness in the past is the product of captains of, of industry with long-term visions. We need leadership in the business community now, not abdication. We need to make notions of corporate social responsibility truly meaningful. Third, don't stop with occupying Wall Street. Occupy the military. The military is likely to play a meaningful role in jumpstarting the political process for global climate change. The military doesn't sugarcoat. They recognize the true national security implications of climate change, the real risks of global destabilization. What happens when there's too little water for drinking, for agriculture, the conflicts that result between bordering nations, the potential for massive migration throughout the world, and the implications of this destabilization for the United States? Members of Congress now can embrace fictions. Military leaders don't. They care about real facts real science, and real risk. When the military leaders of our country start taking and talking about global climate change, national legislation can happen, and it will happen. In short, Uncle Sam needs you. Thanks. Remember, don't just think green, be green.